a cup of coffee, sit back and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life features stories to inspire and motivate you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Visit CYACYL.com. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Researchers have found that the most profound difference between men and women in middle age is that women are twice as likely to be hopeful about the future. And hopeful we should be. With the right approach, the middle years can be the best time in a woman's life. Today's guest, Dr. Rose Kumar, believes that the current generation of midlife women has a crucial role to play in restoring health and meaning to our world, and that with a framework of understanding of midlife, women can transition through menopause with intrinsic power and wisdom that reconnects them to their real selves. Dr. Kumar is the author of the book, Becoming Real, Harnessing the Power of Menopause for Health and Success. She's board certified in internal medicine and is an expert in integrative medicine, women's health, and stress reduction. Welcome, Dr. Kumar. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Joan. Doctor, I'm excited that you're here today because menopause, it's really gotten a bad rap. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about why you think that's the case. If you look at women today, we're earning higher incomes, we're better educated, we're more experienced with juggling multiple roles, and yet we view this time in our lives as something that's a negative, something we really dread going through. Why do you think that's the case? You know, I think, Joan, that our medical system is partly responsible for this um, perspective towards women in midlife particularly because in, in medicine, in traditional medicine, we view menopause as a deficiency condition, the deficiency of estrogen, the deficiency of progesterone, um, and we are a culture that really is very youth-focused, and so Women in midlife typically feel kind of discarded by society. Um, They feel betrayed by their bodies. And all of this is the way that we're conditioned to view ourselves because of what we value and what the traditional medical model sees us as. So I really have a, I take issue with that because women have been going through menopause since the beginning of time. And in older years, certainly, you know, women were dying earlier. Um, Menopause, sometimes uh, women never even achieved menopause because they died before they went through the hormonal changes. But because we are living longer, we need to really look at this and reframe this uh, transition time in a very different way than we've been told uh, by our medical system that, um, that we're in a deficiency state. It's a transition, and we need to understand the tra- transition from a framework that empowers us and that we can use to maximize our life and vitality. To add to what you just said, years ago, you know, when you got to be 45, 50, people were dying, but now realistically, we could be looking at another 30, 35 years to our life. So, yes. it, you know, it really is a time of rebirth. Yes, it is. And, you know, I, I heard the other day that uh, women that are postmenopausal. Um, the postmenopausal phase of a woman's life is actually longer than the menstrual phase of a woman's life at this time in history. What actually happens to women in the peri- and menopausal stages of life? Well, in in a woman's late 30s, she'll start to feel, um, in general, a more um, intense period of restlessness, agitation, a change in her physiology in terms of the way her periods um, uh, come and go, uh, the, the heaviness of her flow, all of these things begin to change first subtly in a woman's late 30s and then more intensely in her 40s and sometimes even through her 50s until her periods stop. And really what happens is that there's a shift in the progesterone level, which is one of the hormones that the ovaries produces, uh, aside from estrogen and testosterone, the other two hormones that the ovaries produce. But progesterone has really kind of been neglected by our medical system. We don't really look at the value of this hormone, which actually is the hormone that regulates our cycles. 
And as the progesterone levels start declining, uh, women start to get more symptomatic um, at all levels, at levels of their inner connection to themselves, at levels, at, at physiological levels, where their endocrine system starts to feel stressed, as well as at emotional levels where their restlessness increases. And some of the symptoms of uh, progesterone um, transitioning um, that a lot of women will experience is their sleep cycle starts to get altered, and they feel more tired. Their vitality starts to decline. And so first subtly, as I said, in late 30s, and then more profoundly in her 40s, as the levels start to drop more and more, does a woman start to feel um, not herself, as many women say to me. I don't know whose body this is. This doesn't feel like me. And that's typically a, a sign that the progesterone levels are dropping. And is this usually the time when women start to reevaluate their lives, what the future will hold, what their true purpose is? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, women start to feel that what they thought uh, they were identified with or what they thought fulfilled them before this transition occurs no longer fulfills them. It no longer gives them meaning. It starts to feel somewhat empty. And then they start reevaluating their lives and even their social circles, their marriages, their relationships, and, try, and they try to um, uh, reconnect themselves to those relationships from a place that feels more real and more fulfilling to them. The interesting thing, I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Christian Northrup, and she and I spoke about how we are chemically designed for this to occur. When we're younger, we have the hormones that you just spoke about so that we could have children and and nurture and have the maternal instincts. And then when we go through these physiological changes, that's when we shift to become more internal, you know, thinking about ourselves. And, And the interesting thing is that we look at that as a negative. We believe we're selfish when that happens. And I don't know how we can get out of that mindset. Well, I think that that's another um, a result of our conditioning. And we've been conditioned to believe that we are there for others. And any time that we focus on ourselves, we are considered selfish. And we are really conditioned that way where being a good girl implies sacrificing ourselves for others, compromising ourselves for others. We're not supposed to make waves. We're socialized this way. And those socializations and those adaptations that we're taught to embody uh, stop working for us because they're not really true to our, we're not being true to ourselves when we're, when we're behaving from an adapted place. And our whole world has socialized women in this way. So I feel that the physiology is really connected to this uh, reframing or this reclamation process that is internally programmed, in a sense, in our souls, in our psyches, and it is actually universal. It is really women all over the world feel this, but there's no framework for them to really understand that this is a normal, natural, powerful, and necessary process for women to go through. And that's really why it's so difficult for women, is because we don't have that framework that validates that this process is a necessary and powerful one. Doctor, I want to take a break at this point because when we return on the other side, we can talk about how people or how women can implement the framework that you're discussing so that we can change the way we view this time in our life. So we're going to take a break for this week's Good Life Tips. Stay with us for information to help you make the positive life changes that we talk about on the show. When we return, I'll continue my conversation with Dr. Rose Kumar. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman, and our guest today is Dr. Rose Kumar, author of the book, Becoming Real, Harnessing the Power of Menopause for Health and Success. Doctor, before break, we were talking about what happens to us as women during the menopausal phase in our life, and you started to allude to the fact that there's a framework that you believe can help us transition through this time. What is this framework, and and what is it that we can start to do immediately to help us get a different perspective on what it is we're experiencing? You know, part of the framework comes from my approach to medicine, which is called the four-body system approach. In traditional medicine, we focus on the physical body. That's all we focus on. We take it all the way down to the molecular level, and we look at um, life 
from a mechanistic or a physiological perspective, but no other. And that is why traditional medicine really does not include other modalities such as energy medicine or even um, psychology. Psychology is delegated to the psychologists and to the psychiatrists, but not really to the traditionalists, so to speak. So that's one level that the physiological change in menopause occurs, but there are three other levels. There's the mental body, the the emotional body, and the energy body, uh, all of which are actually uh, described in the book, Becoming Real. Uh, This is the framework that we want to be viewing ourselves through, that it is not just a physiological change in hormones that's occurring to us. There are four other bodies that are, or actually three other bodies, that are shifting and changing and feel out of balance based on the choices that we've made in our life and the way that we've been conditioned in our life. So when we view it from the standpoint of um, a body-soul process, I I consider the first half of life until the shift happens physiologically um, as a mental, as a a mind-body process, but the second half of life is a soul-body process where the longings of the soul and the ways that we are spoken to by ourselves, by our inner selves, is so profound and so different than how we've been conditioned that it's, it's very startling to a lot of us. But if we can really understand that this is normal and that this is a process that we all go through as women when we embark on menopause or the perimenopausal time, it really takes that stress off of us because as women say to me, I feel like I'm going crazy, or uh, I feel like my body is betraying me, and they create this adversarial relationship with their bodies, you know, as a body that's now deficient in certain hormones. It's a negative relationship. When we have a framework in which we look at these four bodies shifting in these powerful ways, that we can then understand that this is actually a very powerful transition for us, and we're not as scared anymore. We'll, we learn how to take care of ourselves differently. One of the things that I've really emphasized in this book is how our needs change, how our diets need to change, how we metabolize food differently, and what foods are supportive for a body that's in transition, and what foods are actually toxic for a body in transition. It's not business as usual when our physiology starts to change. We can't keep on eating and drinking the way that we're used to to eating and drinking and not have an effect, a negative effect on our bodies. So a lot of the, the women that I see are learning how to listen to what foods help them, what foods harm them, how they feel when they eat certain foods, how they feel when they drink alcohol, what brings on hot flashes, And I tell women, this is a very different body now. You have to get to know yourself differently because the hormonal changes change your physiology. They change the way your cells talk to each other. And so you really need to, this is a learning curve. It's a learning process that requires a lot of patience and a lot of self-compassion. And when women do this in community, when, you know, when a woman that you talk to says, oh, yeah, I'm going through this too and this is what I'm doing and this is what's happening for me, and you share your story, you know, we feel like we have company, that we're not alone in this process. Well, I'm doing something like that. I've recently started a program under the guidance of a nutritionist, and Mm -hmm. there are a couple of other women in the group, and we're all the same age, and we've all gotten to that point where we sit there and we say, what we used to do to lose weight and to feel better just isn't working, and and that's just what you said. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the foods that you said? Some things are toxic for us at this age. What are some of the things that we should be really avoiding at all costs? Well, sugar is is a a big one. It tops the list. Sugar in the form of processed sugar and in the form of simple carbohydrates, what we call white foods, white flour, white sugar, white rice, white foods, they tend to um, turn into sugar. The simple carbohydrates convert into sugar very quickly in the body. They have what's called a high glycemic index. Their conversion into sugar is very rapid. And sugar metabolism in the body changes as the progesterone drops. And so it becomes more likely for the body to convert sugar into fat uh, as the progesterone level drops than it did when 
we were younger. So our diet needs to be less uh, simple sugar and simple carbohydrate-based and a lot more complex carbohydrate-based, such as brown rice, quinoa, um, some of the whole grains that are non-wheat containing. I find that the bodies of women uh, going through this transition become super sensitive to gluten, and particularly in our country where the gluten uh, where gluten is actually quite uh, toxic to a woman's body because of the the way that the wheat is manufactured and the genetic modification of the wheat, a woman's body, which is shifting with the drop in the progesterone, uh, is much more sensitive to any kind of what we call foreign substances that are put in it. A genetically modified food is a foreign substance to the human body, so the body is not going to metabolize it correctly. If you look in Europe, for example, uh, people are much healthier. They're less obese. They're less uh, weighty around the belly. And part of that is because the quality of the food is not modified the way it is in our country. So in our country, women need to really understand which foods are modified, which foods are not modified, and put as much earth-based, plant-based, organic food in their bodies because their bodies become way more sensitive to chemicals as well as to genetically modified foods. And so that's one place to start. The second layer that I, wanna, uh, that I address with my patients is alcohol. Uh, women do not metabolize alcohol as well as they're transitioning into menopause. And, and actually, a lot of women will use the alcohol to make themselves feel a little bit better or to medicate this feeling of imbalance that is going on in their bodies as their hormones are changing. But then the alcohol has what I would say young energy or heat in it because foods have energy. Foods contain energy. And different foods will aggravate the heat in your body, and other foods will cool your system down. And a lot of this is detailed in the book. And so alcohol happens to be one of those hot foods that when you drink it, it creates a lot more heat or a lot more yang energy in the body, which aggravates the symptoms of reflux and hot flashes and anxiety and insomnia. And so women tend to, in my practice, women will, will um, try to come off alcohol and then reintroduce alcohol and see how they feel. And that gives them a sense as to how their body is processing that alcohol. So those are two, you know, very brief um, examples of how our body changes as the hormones change and the, the, the changes that we have to make, the, cho- the different choices we have to make as we learn what works for us and what doesn't. The book is Becoming Real, Harnessing the Power of Menopause for Health and Success by Dr. Rose Kumar. Doctor, if our listeners would like to get more information about you and your book, where can they go? They can go to my website, which is www.omanicenter.com, O-M-M-A-N-I-C-E-N-T-E-R. I'm also on Facebook under the Omani Center, so feel free to go on Facebook and click like and you will be streamed with a lot of information about these topics. So for more information about Dr. Kumar, you can visit the theomanicenter.com, or as always, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows as podcasts, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, take part in the book club, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Doctor, in about 30 seconds or less, What would you like our listeners to walk away with from this interview? What are some of the most important things that they need to remember? I would think that we need to look at our transition in midlife as a powerful one uh, rather than as a pathology that we've been conditioned to look at ourselves as. Um, I I feel that we need to learn how to cultivate self-compassion and how to become more self-aware and focus on creating balance in our lives so that we can tap into our inner inner wisdom and really embody the body-soul process that midlife uh, is a marker for. Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for spending time with us today. As a woman who is in that time of life, I think it's very important that we reframe the way we view this transitional period. And I do believe it's a time for rebirth, 
And it's also, as you said, a time to reclaim, reclaim our love, self, dreams, desires. So if we make that shift and remember that we're being reborn and we're reclaiming, then we can live those other 35 years as an exciting adventure. Thank you, Joan, for having me. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.